I've described how I wrote my most recent book, Perspective and Guidance for a Time of Deep Discord, because of great concern I feel about how, with issues of most every sort, people today are dividing almost immediately into polar camps. After addressing causes with each chapter in the book, I describe how we might bring culture and mature perspective to one issue where divisiveness too often prevails. I chose the concerns I did because each has something particular to teach about addressing issues more systemically. The healthcare delivery crisis sheds particular light on a key theme I addressed with episode number seven, the critical importance of a new, more culturally mature relationship to limits. I've described how basic observation provides the architecture for the book. In times past when we encountered polarized positions and partisan advocacy, our task was obvious and unquestioned. We assumed that there were only two options, that our job was to figure out which one was right and fight for it. As we look to the future, polarization has very different implications. We recognize that what we are seeing is left and right hands of a larger systemic picture, and the fact of polarization alerts us to the fact that neither side has yet to ask the hard questions that ultimately need to be addressed. I first wrote about the healthcare delivery dilemma even earlier than I did the importance of addressing climate change. In a similar way, initially, I could not have guessed that it would have produced the highly polarized responses that we witness today. Indeed, I assumed that it was a concern that most people would find rather boring. While radical new treatments understandably grab headlines, working out the details of healthcare delivery would seem more the province of hospital administrators and economic bean counters. The health care reform might become so loaded an issue could seem even more perplexing given where the current version of the debate started. The model for which the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, was a Republican plan, the model Mitt Romney instituted in Massachusetts. Yet few concerns today more quickly result in advocates treating to their respective corners. Healthcare delivery makes a particularly good example of just how demanding the important new question can be. As a physician as well as a futurist, it was clear to me decades back that if the healthcare delivery dilemma was not effectively addressed, the result could be an economic and social train wreck. Importantly, the healthcare delivery crisis is not just a U.S. crisis. The factors that make addressing it so challenging apply whatever a country's particularly approach to healthcare. In time, they will confront even the countries that now have the most enlightened of policies. The question that provides the needed starting point for addressing the health care delivery crisis is straightforward, but its implications can stretch us in particularly fundamental ways. How do we make good policy in the face of real economic limits? I've described how the modern age narrative was, a hero was heroic, or more precisely, heroic romantic. Our task on confronting limits has been to defeat or transcend them. The healthcare delivery debate combines two concerns, access to care and cost containment that when put together present us with limits that cannot be escaped. Most immediately they confront us with the reality of economic limits, and ultimately they confront us with an even more fundamental and easily disturbing kind of limit. The need to address economic limits challenges the thinking of both the right and the left. As commonly articulated, the healthcare delivery debate pits free market approaches against more centralized government directed strategies. People assume that choosing one economic approach or the other will provide a solution. In fact, we could make most any kind of approach work, but none of them can work unless we start by first acknowledging the fact of economic, economic limits and their implications. Health care expenditures today are spiraling uncontrollably for everyone, whatever kind of system they employ, and there is no natural end in sight. Advocates on each side tend to pin the problem on inefficiencies and excesses. They assume with, that if we just get the incentives right and set curbs against unreasonable profit-taking, all will be well. 
But while inefficiencies and excesses play some role in today's healthcare crisis, the most important factor is more basic. Spiraling costs are primarily a product of modern medicine's great success. Early innovations like sterile technique and penicillin were relatively cheap. More recent advances, sophisticated diagnostic procedures, exotic new medications, transplant surgeries, and more are increasingly expensive and promise only to get more so. We face a stark reality. Unless we are willing to spend an ever-expanding percentage of nation's resources on health care, we have no choice but to restrict health care spending. This circumstance puts before us a whole new order of ethical challenge. We need only look to extreme reactions that follow any suggestion that we might have to ration care to appreciate the newness of what is being asked of us. We've always rationed care, at least in the sense of withholding care from those who are not able to pay for it and often effective care has simply not been available. But what is being required of us today is different. If we are to stop spiral and costs, eventually we must consciously limit health care and not just care that is of unquestionable value, uh, is of questionable value, but, but care that is of real benefit. An exercise I've often done with groups highlights the unsettling reality of what is being asked of us. I start by handing participants a list of patient profiles, including both information about patients' lives and information about their illnesses, along with a budget. I, just, I then send the groups off to a room for a couple hours with instructions to decide how the money should be spent. The choices that the exercise requires of participants can be so emotionally and morally wrenching that people refuse to make them. But the exercise is not just an abstraction. It presents the task we inescapably face if we are to effectively address health care limits. Few people in the political sphere recognize the full implica implications of the health care delivery crisis. The Affordable Care Act addresses access to care, but in spite of its name, it does little of substance, of substance to confront health care costs. Calls for Medicare for All better address access, but in the end almost wholly ignore cost containment while denying that they are doing so. Republicans want their own plan, but they clearly have little appreciation for the complexities involved, certainly not the economic complexities. Eventually, we must confront the fact of real limits. The need to confront economic limits also highlights each of the other new skills and capacities I've touched on. Making health care choices with an acceptance of real limits to what we can afford demands a really quite ultimate kind of responsibility. And because there are no cut and dried rules for making such decisions, we necessarily face easily overwhelming complexities and uncertainties. And again, too, we confront the role of context. What addressing health care limits ask is going to be very difficult different depending on when and where choices need to be made. Rarely even in the, with the best of thinking will we have the luxury of one-size-fits-all prescriptions. We reasonably ask just what it is that makes the task of confronting economic limits so much more demanding than people tend to assume. The need to make agonizing choices could be enough of an explanation. And the fact that choices require that this much of us certainly adds to the challenge. But there is more, and more of major consequences. In the end, effectively confronting health care limits demands a new relationship to the most taboo of limits-related topics, our human mortality. Medicine has always been about life and death decisions. But limiting care in the sense I'm suggesting involves consciously withholding care that might at least delay death's arrival. And this rec add this recognition and we get the needed even larger question. What would it mean to approach health care in a way that acknowledges the importance of a new maturity in our relationship with death? 
It's important to appreciate how fundamentally this further question is new and significant. Death represents life's ultimate limit to what we can know and control. Always before in our history, cultural belief has served to keep death's full significance at arm's length. Increasingly, we are having to confront that this kind of distancing has stopped being an option. Effectively confronting health care limits could make addressing other death-related issues such as abortion, suicide, or capital punishment seem like child's play. What exactly would good political leadership with regard to health care delivery challenge look like? Certainly, it would include some of what we find with the best of current efforts at health care reform. It would emphasize better covering the uninsured, giving greater attention to preventive care, addressing drug costs, and more extensive application of evidence-based medicine. But polit but politicians who want to provide real leadership would also reopen the conversation in a way that better acknowledges the fact of real economic limits. And over time, leadership must go further. It must help people in coming, in coming to better appreciate the importance of a greater maturity in our human relationship to death. Needed leadership must ultimately come from all of us. People today tend to celebrate every new, more expensive medical advance at the same time that care but becomes increasingly unaffordable, both for individuals and for society. And as citizens, we must be clear that this is not sustainable and ultimately really not sane. And like it or not, political leadership is one of the last places where we are likely to find an appreciation for a greater maturity in our relationship to death. That can happen best through our everyday conversations. In fact, we are already seeing changes when it comes to this more ultimately challenge, only for steps, the ones that are significant. For example, we are witnessing growing recognition of the importance of end-of-life conversations between patients and doctors. The role of quality hospice care is increasingly appreciated, and states are beginning to pass legislation that supports doctor-assisted suicide. None of this would happen without broader societal changes in how we view death and its implications. The questions presented by the healthcare delivery crisis are not just harder than we tend to realize. Arguably, they are harder than we have been capable of recognizing up to this point in our development as a species. But they are also the questions that we have to ask. It is important to appreciate how more directly confronting health care limits, even just economic limit, could have effects well beyond the obvious. It could contribute not just to rethinking access to care, but also to increasingly mature and empowered insights about what it takes to be healthy, what it means to heal, and more broadly about the requirements of a healthy society. For today, isn't that just what the doctor ordered? A fresh, really big picture look at the whole healthcare endeavor. In the end, confronting healthcare limits should result not just in care that we can afford, but also in care that is more complete, that better addresses the whole of who we are as individuals and as societies. And while getting there will ask a lot of us, we can also think of it simply as bringing the needed new common sense to the healthcare sphere. As always, invite your thoughts and questions.